Is this working? Okay, thank you for the introduction. This is joint work with my professors, Jan Hoffman and Frank Fenning, who has been inspiring me, just like everyone else. So let me start by first defining what I mean by parallel complexity, sometimes also called as the span. So suppose you have a network of machines connected to each other, and they're together performing some distributed computation. And I'm interested in knowing what the total time is going to take for the whole computation to complete. Now, of course, this question doesn't have a fixed answer. It depends on how much parallelism there is in the system. The more the parallelism, the less the execution time. And the amount of parallelism in the system depends on, for instance, how much data dependency there is in the system. Do processes need to wait for messages from other processes? Or are there data races created due to shared memory? And so on and so forth. So the next question is, well, why are we interested in parallel complexity in the first place? And that's because it has several applications. It can be used to compute the complexity of parallel algorithms. It can be used to design optimal scheduling policies. It can be used to compute the throughput and latency of stream processing applications. And finally, it can be used to compute the response time of concurrent data structures, for instance, insertion and deletion into concurrent stacks, queues, and so on. And I'll get to some of these applications during the talk. So the next question is, well, where does session types come into this whole thing? And this is the place where it comes in. As we all know, concurrent programs are hard to analyze, and that's because of a variety of reasons. But my claim is that session types can actually help with this problem. So let's see how. First, session type programs have no shared memory. All concurrency happens through message passing. So we don't have to worry about shared memory overhead on the execution time. Second, the message passing that does happen is strictly enforced by the session types themselves. And so we don't have, so it's much easier to do the analysis of execution time when the types control very strictly what the messages are going to be exchanged. Thirdly, the session type system guarantees that there can never be any deadlocks in the system. So we don't have to worry about deadlocks affecting the execution time. And there are many more simplifications that session types provide that I don't have time to get into. You can look at our paper for that. So just a brief overview of our contributions. On the highest level, I've designed a type system to analyze the timing of the message exchanges between the processes in a session type program. And just to go into a little bit more detail, the types in my system define the timing of the message exchanges. Our type system, as I'm going to show, is at a sweet spot between precision and flexibility. And they're both important components, as I will show in the talk. The type system has been proven sound with respect to the cost semantics tracking the time, which means that the timing that is predicted by the type system will exactly be realized by the semantics at runtime. The type system is, that we propose is a conservative extension to the standard session type system. And this is a very important point. We actually worked very hard to make this a conservative extension so that we don't have like a completely new out of the blue type system just to do the parallel complexity analysis. Our type system, of course, works on all the standard session types examples, and I'll show some of them. And finally, our type system can be parametrized to count the resource that the programmer is interested in. And what I mean by that is I have so far talked about analysis of the execution time, right? But I haven't really defined what I mean by time. And that's actually one of the strengths of our type system is that the programmer can define what they mean by time. They can define what we call the cost model, which basically assigns the time cost to each and every operation in our program. So for instance, they have, we have this R cost model in our paper which assigns a cost of one to every receive. The time advances by one unit every time you receive a message. Similarly, we have this RS cost model where the time advances by one every time you do a receive or a send. And these cost models are realized by inserting delays in the source code at the appropriate locations. And the time only advances when you execute a delay on nothing else. So that's like an abstraction over the execution time. And the programmer doesn't have to worry about adding these delays. The programmer can just specify the cost model without writing any of these delays. And these delays are automatically inserted by the compiler. OK, so let me go to the technical part of the talk and start by defining what the types are. So let me take a simple example, a simple stream processor, which takes two streams as input and produces a stream as output. And suppose I'm interested in computing the rate of the output stream given the rates of the input stream. Now, my claim is that to compute the parallel complexity of such a stream processor, 
you actually need to compute the timing of the messages. And I claim that this is both necessary and sufficient. It's necessary to ensure compositionality of the system. If you want to compose smaller stream processors to form bigger stream processors, then you need to know the exact rate of the input and output stream of every stream processor. And it's sufficient because you can think of the parallel complexity of the stream processor as just the timing of the final message which signals the end of the computation. Okay, so moving on, let me take a very simple example, and this will kind of introduce session types to you as well. So suppose I have a simple bits type, it's just an internal choice, the provider's choice, between B0, B1, and dollar. In the case of B0 and B1, the type recurses back to bits, and in the case of dollar, it goes to one, which signals the, uh, the end of the stream, the termination. So dollar is like the termination symbol for this bit stream. And I'm looking at this process named two, which is offering along a channel C, which has type bits. So what it's going to do is it's going to produce a binary stream representing the number two along the channel C. And this is how the implementation looks like. The process two offering on C, and the first thing it does is it sends the B0 label along C. So that's the line that's been highlighted. So we start with the bits type on C, and once the B0 message is sent, the type of C again advances to bits, right? Because that's the continuation type according to the bits type. So now we send the B1 label. Once the B1 label is sent, the type again advances to bits because that's the continuation type. Now we send the dollar label. Once the dollar is sent, this time the type advances to one because we've sent the stream completely, and now it's time to terminate. That's what indicated by the one type. So then we send the close message, and we're done, right? So as you can see, this type doesn't tell you anything about the timing information. It doesn't tell you when any of these messages are going to be sent. And so suppose I want to enforce some cost model. I want to say, okay, sending a message causes a unit delay, which means time advances by one every time you send a message. So essentially, I want to send B0 at time zero, B1 at time one, dollar at time two, and the close message at time three. So how do I actually enforce this in the type? So I do this by this very simple next operator, or the circle operator, which expresses this unit delay, which appears in every continuation which means whenever you send a B0, B1, or a dollar, you have this next operator which expresses this unit delay. So let's look at the process implementation again. So you start with the bits type, you start with sending B0 at time zero, and once this B0 is sent, the type now advances to circle bits and not bits, right? So at this point, the only thing you can do, the only thing you can do is execute the delay, right? That's nothing, you cannot do anything else at this point. This is enforced by our type system. And so you execute this delay, the time advances to one, the type advances to bits, and now you can send the B1 label. So you send the B1 label, again, once that is sent, the type again advances to circle bits because that's the continuation type. And so again, you execute this delay, the type advances to two, the, uh, sorry, the time advances to two, the type advances to bits, and now you can uh, send the dollar label. Once the dollar label is sent, the type now advances to circle one, you execute another delay. Once that is executed, the time advances to three, the type advances to one, and now you can send the close message. And so you can see just having this one single type operator over the usual session types, we can enforce very precisely at what time each and every message is going to be sent. Okay, so let's quickly look at the typing rule for the circle. So as you can see, executing this delay will consume this circle. The circle has been applied pointwise uh, in the conclusion on the left, uh, the circle will be consumed from every channel in the context and the channel on the result, right? And this is kind of a weird typing rule, right? It breaks the locality property of the type system because just executing the single delay changes the type of everything in the context and the result. And type through, typing rules are generally more local than that. They affect one variable at a time, right? But this affects everything in the context. And I'm emphasizing this because this is a subtle point. We were trying really hard to come up with a system where this delay rule is sort of local. But it took us a while, at least it took me a while, to realize that time is actually a global property and it will advance on every channel, not just one channel. So we have to come up with a global version of this rule. Okay, so uh, let's look, a, look at a few examples uh, for this uh, circle operator. So now the bits type has been generalized. I'm sending one bit every R units of time and not just every one unit of time. So 
So let's take a simple copy process, just copy the incoming stream to the outgoing stream. As you can see, the bits type is common, both at X and Y. So this stream processor has the same throughput as the input stream, but it has a latency of one. You can actually see a circle on the Y type, right? Which means that there's a unit delay at the outgoing type. So there's a latency of one. Similarly, there's the plus one process, which increments one to the incoming uh, stream and produces it on the outgoing stream. And so again, this has the same throughput as the input stream, but again, a latency of one. And now suppose I want to do a plus two. I, want, I create two copies of plus one and sequentialize them. So if I try to assign types to this, you'll see that the incoming type is bits, the intermediate type is circle bits, and the outgoing type is circle, circle bits. So the plus two process, which is just two plus ones composed together, has the same throughput again as the input stream, but a latency of two. And you can see how we can compose uh, these streams, smaller stream processors to form bigger stream processors, right? And see the compositionality of our type system here. Okay, so is this enough? Can we type everything using this circle operator? And the answer is no. So let's, uh, let me show you a counterexample. And suppose there's this queue which stores four elements, A, B, C, and D, and I want to insert a fifth element, E, right? So the way it's inserted, it travels all the way to the end where the element is actually inserted. So let me try and type this using the circle or the next operator. So as we all know, the next operator can only express a constant delay. It, you can only put a constant number of circles. So it can only express a constant insertion rate. But if you look at the tail of the queue, it keeps growing bigger and bigger with every insertion rate. So the longer the queue gets, the more time it takes for the element to reach the end of the queue. So the slower the insertion rate is at the tail of the queue. And so to keep up a constant insertion rate at a tail, what you'll have to do is you have to send every element faster and faster so that to, to kind of keep up with the increasing size of the queue. So if you kind of, this is like a weird implementation of a queue because we're required to send elements faster and faster. If these elements were like candies, then this queue is like this kid who wants these candies faster and faster every time. But we want to have some control over this. We, we want to give candies to the kids when we want to and not when they want to, right? So we want to have a system where we can express some flexibility. So you can see that the next operator here, it's too precise. We want some flexibility. So let's see how we can add some flexibility to the type system. And we add it by using this, these two type operators, the box and the diamond. So the box operator basically says that the provider, the queue in our previous slide, will always be ready to receive a token it will always be in this ready state. And the client, which was us giving the candies, it will eventually give the token. It will eventually give the candy or the insert or the delete message. And so the provider has no idea when these candies or when this token is going to come. Only the client does. And this is different from the circle operator where both the client and the provider knew exactly when the messages are going to be sent. And the diamond operator is just because in session types, every type, has a, every type operator has a dual. The diamond is just a dual of the box operator where the roles of the client and providers flip, basically. And so can we type the queue with this box operator? And the answer is yes. So the box at the head, uh, at the start of the type, basically means that it can always, whenever it's in this state, it can always accept the insert and delete messages, no matter when they come. And in the insertion case, you can see that there are three units of circles before the type recurses, right? So that means when, once you start inserting the elements, there's like a three units of delay before the queue behaves, uh, be before the queue starts behaving as a queue again. It starts taking more elements in. So the response time for insertion is three, and similarly in the delete case, the response time for deletion is one. So you can see how we are at this sweet spot between precision and flexibility. Like we have complete. Uh, flexibility on giving the insert and the delete messages. The box operator gives us complete flexibility there. And the circle gives us complete precision on the response time. So we can see how we can use these two operators to kind of match between precision and flexibility, keep a balance between the two. Okay, so quickly the typing rules for the box. So uh, the provider, as we said, it's waiting for this exchange token, which we are calling the now message the client will eventually send this now message. And once the now message is received, the type of X along which the provider is offering just changes from box S to S. 
but the context should have a special form because you don't know when the now message is going to come in, right? And so you have to be, you have to be you know, special form so that you can be delayed indefinitely. And you can look, the, look at the paper for more details about this typing rule. So it has to be, I've introduced this judgment delayed box. It has to have this particular form for this program to, or for the system to be well typed. And the client is very simple. It just sends the now message along X and the type of X just updates from box S to S. Okay, so now suppose I want to compare stacks and queues. So I type the stacks, I type the queues, and I want to say, okay, which one of these is more efficient? So now you can directly see from the type that the response time for insertion for stacks is one because that's when the type recurses, and that's three for queues. And for the case of deletion, the response time is one, both for stacks and queues. So you can see directly from the type without even looking at the implementation anymore that stacks are more efficient than queues, right? We don't have, and that's another strength of our type system. We don't have to look at the implementation to do this efficiency comparison. Okay, so just to conclude the section on this type system, some features of it, uh, as I said earlier, it's parametric in the cost model. The programmer can define what they mean by time. It's compositional. The types describe individual uh, processes, not just whole programs. The circle operator was providing precision. The box and diamond were there for flexibility. It was a conservative extension. We just added these three type operators, and uh, everything else in the system remained the same. It's general. I've only showed a few examples here, but there are many, many more in the paper. And automation is part of our future work. Our type system supports type checking automatically, but not type inference, and that's something we are working on. So um, I've kind of glanced, glossed over a few things, of course, in the talk for lack of time. And so in the paper, we, I've talked about like how do these box and the diamond operators interact with the circle. In particular, how can I define this subtyping relation, which is both sound and complete in the presence of these operators? How I can do time reconstruction, which means given the uh, original source code and the type of the program, can I insert these delays, whens, and nows automatically so that the program type checks in our, in our enhanced type system? I've defined the cost semantics, obviously, which, uh, where each process kind of stores a local clock, which determines when the messages are going to be uh, exchanged. And then there's the soundness theorem, which is basically a proof of progress in preservation, which connects the type system to the semantics, which says basically that the timing that are predicted by the type system will exactly be realized by the cost semantics. And how these cost semantics that I've given in the paper connect to the standard cost semantics for session types. And finally, uh, I've been talking about typing just one process at a time, but we can also type a set of processes which can potentially be at different local clocks, right? So how do we do that? Uh, details in the paper. So just to conclude, um, today we saw a type system on uh, analyzing the timing of the message exchanges uh, among the processes in a session type system, um, which was connected to the cost semantics by a soundness theorem. It was a conservative extension. I only added these three type operators where the circle was providing precision, the box and diamond were providing flexibility, and we looked at several examples. We looked at stream processors, uh, and their throughput and their latency. We did an efficiency comparison between stacks and queues, and there are many, many more examples in the paper. So if you're interested in looking at more examples, I encourage you to look at the paper. Thank you. All right, we have quite a few questions. Uh, Michael Klein asks, does your system support cost models with randomness? Well, currently it does not support cost models with randomness, but um, there is some earlier work uh, that I've done uh, where we weren't doing this for session types, but we're doing this for OCaml programs, where it also did not have randomness, but um, we could give, like you, you could mention, okay, every operation takes this much time on a precise hardware. So this operation takes like one nanosecond, some other takes three nanoseconds, and then you can uh, like give a precise time on the hardware. If you want to encode some randomness, I, I think what you'll have to do is you'll have to define some kind of a probability distribution over the execution time of each operation, and then somehow do like an expected time of this program. And my advisor, Jan Hoffman, he has done some work on estimating the execution time of probabilistic programming languages 
So maybe we can take some ideas from there and use it here to do, do some kind of randomness. All right. David A.D. asks, can you, sorry, can you prove upper bounds on time delays without necessarily knowing the exact delay? So that's a good question. So the box, or uh, sorry, the circle operators that we have here, they like give this very precise timing. They tell you exactly when the messages are going to uh, come in or go out. So if you have like an upper bound, if the operator, if you have a different operator which tells you the upper bound and not the exact timing, then I, uh, I mean I, I can talk to you offline also. But what happens is if there are two different branches and in the in one branch, you take more time than the else branch, then there is this synchronization problem that happens when the two branches merge. And so the input, for example, if we have like a binary stream or something, then the input still remains the same, right? It's still going to do going to the else branch and the if branch, right? So if one branch takes more time, then kind of one branch gets ahead of the other branch in the, uh, in, in, on, on the right but the input still stays the same, and that leads to synchronization problem. So we were thinking about this. It's like we were thinking if we can give like a type operator which gives us upper bounds and not the exact bounds. But like because of the synchronization problems, we, were, we had to introduce a type operator which gives us this precise bound and not, not, not an upper bound. So it's possible to do that, but uh, you can run into problems, so you'll have to take care of them some, somewhere else. Oh, next question is from an anonymous ICP attendee. Uh, which semantic model did you use to prove soundness of your type system? So, um, this, so okay, the session types have a usual um, semantic. Like you can read like the earlier literature for that. What we did was we added a cost on top of it. So we have a cost model which says, okay, for example, sending a message has a cost of one, or receiving a message has a cost of one. And then the cost semantics kind of models this cost. Um, and then while we are proving soundness, we, we kind of use the same cost model. So you first fix a cost model, which can be parametric. And uh, well, not parametric, but symbolic. And the type system and the cost semantics are both parametric in this cost model. So we're kind of using the same cost model for both of them. And then the soundness says, OK, whatever types, uh, timing are predicted by the type system will be realized by the semantics. So you can plug in whichever cost model you'll do, you want, and you will still have the same soundness theorem. So the soundness theorem is kind of parametric in the cost model. Let's have another one. Your modalities are similar to linear logic exponential bank, which also require global sequent rule. Can you comment on that? So is equivalent to the bank operator, you said? Linear uh, logic exponential bank. So OK, so the bank operator, um, so we don't, the type system that we have or the session type fragment that I'm working here, it doesn't have the bang operator. The bang operator generally has a copying semantics, which means that like, uh, like kind of think of like a server client where server creates a copy of it and gives it to the client. And so we don't have that in our system. Um, the type, type operators that we have here, they actually, I think they come from, or at least uh, in my opinion, they come from temporal logic where they describe the time. So I'm not completely sure what this question is, but I don't think they relate that much to the bank operator. Um, yeah. All right, let's wrap up here and thank Angush again. <laughs>